My name's Dave Lonigan, Arctic Field Productions, and you're watching Earth on Fire 2023, a climate change documentary. This drone footage I took myself in Majuro Island, Marshall Islands, just recently in the Pacific region. Now you can see visually the difference between ocean level and the village Majuro, which is the capital of the Marshall Islands. The water laps literally up against the edge of the town. Sea level to street level, I measured one evening when I went for a wander, I took my equipment out, it was high tide, a king high tide admittedly, I measured the difference between high tide and the street level, 42 centimetres, that's all they've got to play with. Now with a factored in sea level rise of 60 centimetres over the next 80 years, this place has a very uncertain future. Now the highest point in Majura Island is 1.9 metres above sea level. I don't know where that was. I found a bridge, I think that man-made bridge was about three metres above sea level. Everywhere else was barely a metre above sea level. It's very evident when you fly in on a plane, as you're coming in across the ocean, you can see the land and the ocean and the atoll side, either side of that land, strip of land where these people reside. It's staggeringly obvious they're in peril before anyone else on the planet. The Pacific region is going to get more affected by sea level rise over the coming, what well already is, over the coming years quicker than anywhere else on the planet. They are the canary in a coal mine and that's a bit ironic because we know greenhouse gas emissions is causing sea level rise from ocean uh, solidity changes and also air temperature changes from burning of coal, oil and gas, fossil fuels. Why are we still on fossil fuels when we have access to renewable fuels and we have for a very long time? Why are we still burning coal, oil and gas around the planet? I don't know. It's insane. Probably because it's cheaper for now. Now, there was a study done by the World Bank and the Maduro, sorry, and the Marshall Islands government. The study was done in 2021. They wanted to work out projected sea level rises. Uh, and by the end of this century, 40%, this is what the study found, 40% of Maduro will be underwater uninundated with seawater through their town, through their homes, through their businesses. 40% of this entire town will be uninundated with seawater 24-7. That's not good uh, for them. It's not good for anyone because you can't really say, oh, it's not going to affect me. It is going to affect you. It's just going to maybe take a little bit longer. I'm unsure why our governments are not looking forward 200 years into where they want our planet to be, the people on our planet where they want to be, rather than worrying about what's going to happen in the next five or 10 years. We should be looking forward 200 years and planning for that sort of a future, which means we realistically need to get off these bloody fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, start using renewables or places like this and places like where you live are going to be heavily affected before you know it. These places have already been affected. Now I had a conference meeting while I was in the Marshall Islands with four very interesting individuals. I met an Alexander Panano. He is the president of the Marshall Islands Red Cross Society. He's been there for 30 years. I had a couple of chats, uh, chats, uh, chats with him before the cameras were on. I went to his surgery, had a bit of a yak, and he was a pretty interesting guy and very, very adamant about what's going to happen to his country uh, in the next 10, 20 years, and it's already happening with the increase in disease because of the increase in temperatures. And I also spoke to another very interesting bloke, Jack Needenthal. Now, he's the former Marshall Island Secretary of Health and Human Resources. He's been there also for over 30 years. He's a smart guy. And uh, he had a lot to say. And I've got extracts from that conference meeting I'm going to, I'm going to show you very, very soon. Uh, I also spoke at length with a, uh, Lee Jacklick. He's a meteorologist with the US National Weather Survey. 25 years in that position, so that's 25 years first out of experience in the Pacific region in the Marshall Islands, knowledge that um, he is willing to pass on and just factual information. I mean, I've read so much, I get sent so much information about sea level rise and, and, and air temperature increases and global warming and I, I read everything I get sent, thanks to all the people that send information in, all these climatologists and oceanographers and uh, uh, it's fascinating but 
you almost get, a, if you're not careful, you come to a sense of, oh, it's, it's unfixable. It's not unfixable. Just get off coal, oil and gas, get onto renewables and stop countries like this being washed away. Where do these people go? Yes, they've got an affiliation with the USA, but uh, they've been there for 3,000 years. Do you think they want to go and live somewhere else? They're going to live somewhere else because they have to. Uh, it's, not, it's not proper. Um, these uh, uh, countries in the, in, in, in the Pacific region, they aren't causing greenhouse gas emissions. They're at the forefront of what's happening because the westernised world has this obsession with coal, oil and gas. So as we keep uh, acting, using those as our primary energy resource, we are A, polluting the planet, we are A, increasing air temperatures, we are A and B, oh, A, B and C, and we're also, sorry, and we're also increasing ocean temperatures. So we're changing the ocean patterns around the world. It's, it's just absolute bloody insanity, really. The first coal-fired power station was built in the 1880s. So think about it, that's 140 years ago. We're still doing the same thing. I mean, come on, get on with it, find a better way. There is a better way. It's up in the sky, it's called the sun, and it's free. Uh, now, when I, I spoke to uh, Dr. Alexander Panana, he came up with a really interesting statement. I, I, this is when I spoke to him in his surgery, and he said, David, our country, I write everything down when people talk to me, our country is the forefront of global climate crisis. Even as I speak, we are facing climate change-related increase in diseases, including dengue fever. Who wants that? I don't. And then, of course, there's the increasing in drought and the uh, regular coastal inundation of seawater because of larger swells and king tides. Now, the patterns in the ocean uh, activity are changing. That's what I'm hearing all the time. Now, have a listen to what Dr. Alexander Panano had to say in this meeting because this guy's got his finger on a pulse. He's a smart guy. And I want you to listen to what he had to say. It's first-hand information. Have a listen and to I, this. Um, I, I just keep getting the sensation that people won't really be concerned about it until the sea levels are rising to such an extent that they're coming into their front doors. <coughs> that's, that's going to be almost too late. <coughs> yes. In fact, uh, <coughs> I witnessed uh, one devastating effect of king tide in uh, the nearby adults of Arno when the ambassador of uh, Japan and Taiwan wouldn't go without me mm. because he said, we need a doctor to be with us. So we went because uh, Langar, one of the, I think it's northern part of uh, Arno. Where is East? Yeah. Yeah. And my yeah. God, the king tide, just all those uh, pontoons, water catchment that they have, they were out to play there by the shore. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the, the, the water catchment I mean, uh, uh, deep wells they have is all covered with sand and salt water. Mm. And I said, my God, and all the, the, the road was littered with the big uh, rocks and debris coming from the uh, lagoon side. And that was a disaster, a big uh, king tide that hit that island. And not only Arno, but and I had quite an interesting series of conversations off camera with him. I'm going back to Marshall Islands in December. We've got a town meeting organised to get some uh, views of the people on the street that live there, you know, the, the people that are at the forefront of, of, of this sea level rise. I went out on the last day I was there after we'd finished filming and I was just sitting down the street having a coffee and this guy came up and he sat down next to me and he goes, you are producer Dave, yes? I went, well, uh, yes, yes, I guess so. I, I, I was just was, I was taken off by his call. I just thought, oh, what? what? And anyway, and he said to me, thank you for coming because our problem is not going away and we didn't cause it, but we are gonna get, uh, we're gonna get washed away. Our, I, he said, I lived on an atoll. He mentioned the name of it. He said, I had to move to Majuro because my land was washed out, my house was washed away by the increasing tidal surge. He said, the storms are getting worse. Now, he was about 65, maybe 70, so again, first-hand, on-the-ground knowledge. You can read uh, books till the bloody cows come home, but when you go to these countries and you see, uh, this is flying back in over Majuro here, and you see the actual, you know, seawalls being built, being constructed, they're not doing them for something to fucking do, are they? 
they're trying to save their habitat, they're trying to save their own country. Um, lovely people, I, I felt really sad when I was there, I thought wow, this place is really in peril. Now the US government pours a lot of money into the Marshall Islands as a, 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 some sort of an association there with the US, but realistically you need to help them help themselves because uh, I don't think you can stop the oceans from coming in. Why? I don't know what they're going to do long term. It's, it's, it's a real quandary. They're not going to leave their hometown. I mean, would you? You know? Now, keep watching. I've also got an interview. A few comments here. You want to listen to this guy. Oh, uh, yeah. Jack Needenthal. This is the guy. This guy's quite interesting. Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Republic of the Marshall Islands government. Now, he said, in cases where ocean water completely sweeps over the land, it happens at Killy, which is an island atoll, increasing regularity. The agriculture that residents depend on, their livelihoods, is being destroyed. So, uh, they're losing their food production. Now, it's interesting when I was talking to Dr. Alexander Padana, he said there was a huge influx of imported foods coming into the Marshall Islands over the 20, 30 years because they lost all their, uh, they lost their ability to, to grow their own crops. So they bring all these imported foods in, and of course they're, you know, canned foods and, and processed foods. Dietary problems through the bloody roof because those people aren't used to it. So now you've got this massive diabetes problem running right through the Marshall Islands. You know, it's just terrible. You think, this is caused by global warming. You know, it's, it's, it's undeniable, really. Have a listen to what Jack Needenthal had to say. Really interesting guy. I got in with him really well. I thought, this guy's pretty switched on. And he had a lot of interesting things. Just listen to this. All, all the information I'm, I'm reading and seeing, and I've been sent, I get sent almost too much information. There's a predicted sea level rise of 40 centimetres in the next 30, 40 years. But it doesn't stop there, it just keeps going. Yeah. Because we've already locked ourselves into that sea level rise due to greenhouse gas, gas emissions, we're already in the atmosphere. So if you get a 30, 40 centimetre sea, sea level rise here, that's going to have a major impact on this. Or on swimming. This. You're swimming, yeah. So at some point, it becomes untenable, doesn't it? <clears throat> I, it, if you look on my website, bikinitold.com, I have pictures yep. there from 2015 where the airport on Kili, where the people of Bikini live, looks like, looks like a river. Really? It, it, the water came up so high, it covered yeah. the place. We had never seen that before. That it happened also yeah. in 2011, those two different years. And it was stunning. And it drove us to say to the, the U.S., you have to move the people of Bikini off that island because it just keeps getting inundated because we got two times in four years. It yeah. hasn't happened since then. Kili is an island. A single it island. It doesn't have a little... Yeah. Right. So, island, so. so the most dramatic thing I saw was a kid walking along the... and He's like knee deep in water and he's got a bag of rice and there's a guy with a just a cell phone filming him and the kid's walking along talking about where he's going with the bag of rice but he sounds like it's a normal thing. Yeah. That's what kind of, it wasn't the rice, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't the water all around him. He's talking like, oh, I do this like every day. <laughs> and wow. he's been doing it for, you know, he, they got hit with those waves a couple of days in a row. You so, know, there's a depression in the middle of the island. Yeah. It's oh. more flooded now than before. Yeah. More water comes in there. And keeping it. And, and keeping it. Yeah, it's a swamp. I lived there for three years. Oh, okay. One thing I noticed too is, uh, is the change, the cycle of uh, season for the fruits here. I deal with fruits and uh, bananas and, and uh, bananas, but uh, pandanas and breadfruit. And we used to, we could tell when mm. the season of, to harvest. Yeah. Now it's not, you cannot. So the seasons are anymore. changing as well? No, it's not, it changes a lot. Yeah. The, 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 the pandanas, you would think that every, you, you know the months are coming up, when they come from, you know, we don't have pandanas. I mean, there's no season for it. Wow. And it changes it change yeah. from that. Yeah, oh, that's a, sorry. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> and I'm the former Secretary of Health. I was the Secretary of Health for the last four years, a little over four years, and was Secretary of Health during the entire pandemic. We had a 38 straight month uh, state of health emergency here. And before that, I was the first Secretary General of the Red Cross, as Dr. Pignano mentioned. And before that, I 
worked 33 years for the people of Bikini. My wife's uh, a Bikinian and five kids and seven grandkids. So uh, we've seen a lot of, like, like Lee mentioned and the others have mentioned, we've seen quite a bit of changes. And what I like to do as a former Secretary of Health, people often want to talk about sea level change. I like to talk about the impact from diseases like we've never seen before over the past four or five years. Uh, we've had an incredible experience in terms of fighting things off. So uh, I'd like to, I'll be talking somewhat about that. Is that because of the change in, in, in sea temperature? I am firmly convinced. We had dengue fever here uh, when I first came, my very first year. That was when the state of health emergency began here in August of 2019. And we had never seen a, an outbreak like that before. It lasted for over a year here in Maduro. We had about 4,000 cases, and you know you have about a 70% uh, asymptomatic rate with that, so there was probably over 10,000 cases of dengue wow. here. And Dr. Pignano can expand on what that was like, but it was quite an extraordinary. We, we were having 50 to 60 people a night in uh, the ER uh, at the height of that, when it was exactly when Wuhan began yeah. in, in oh. January 2020. Yes. Mm. And that's why we closed the borders. We, had, we did not want to deal with two different diseases at the same time. Um, so you see those kinds of things happening here um, when, when it's never happened like that before with the pandemic and everything else. So it's like disease is a big, big factor with, in my mind when it comes to climate change. Thank you, Jack. Well said. Interesting guy. I hope to catch up with him again when I'm back in December. Uh, I think he's got a lot more information that I can draw out of him, which will be interesting for our viewers. I hope you stay tuned and you're interested. Now also, Lee Jacklick, he's a meteorologist with the National Survey, US National Survey, 25 years in that position. Now he was explaining to me the variation in ocean temperatures from one end of the Marshall Islands to the other and how it's impacting on uh, fishing and how it's impacting on air temperatures and how it's impacting on those people. Have a listen. This guy is finger on the pulse yet again. These people only came to this meeting with me because they were interested. Uh, I, I contacted them from Australia. None of them had ever met me. They were all willing to come forward to a conference meeting, uh, get filmed. I, I appreciate that. And they all had very interesting things to say. Have a listen to, the, to Lee Jacklick. Have a listen to this. In the waves and storms are getting more severe and a, a lot less predictable. Would that be right? Um, yeah. Well, the, um, the other thing that we at the Met Office get to concentrate on, not only on the uh, changing of the climate, but these are, we, you have to know that these are very really low-lying at all. Mm. And they're very susceptible to any changes where there is a minor change in the atmosphere or in, on the ocean, that there's going to be um, negative consequences. So what we um, also concentrating on is the extreme events. Not only is the climate changing, it is changing, but gradually, but then you have all these extremes that yeah, are yeah. occurring in between, uh, we can, we, um, the extreme the, events become yeah, more we, extreme. Yeah, okay. and, um, and more frequent. Um, seasonal changes, mm. they are more frequent, mm. they are more extreme. And case in point, what the doctor was mentioning about is um, high tides. Now the um, king tide mm -hmm. is a recent um, mm -hmm. terminology, that, but these are actually high spring tides. <laughs> But then, when you tend to get um, a very extreme eye tide, then people tend to name them otherwise, like yeah, king tides yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. But we've been having eye tides. All these uh, is a is a natural cycle. But then, when the cycle kind of go upbeat, and then you have eye eye tides, eye eye temperatures, yeah, low yeah. low temperatures, and then these cool. are the extreme. And from an atoll perspective, that's very dangerous for mm, us. Mm. Even a very minor change that can have a significant impact 
on the ions, on the atoms. So this the other thing that we two monitors. Uh, Major has been very, um, it's been very frequented by uh, flooding from the uh, from the from the sea. Mm. But then people are saying that oh, the, this might be from the sea level that is rising. That is, but on top of that, there are the extreme events, the extremities yeah. within that. Um, seasonal change within uh, uh, the time of the year. So can anyone tell me long term uh, uh, the problems here I'm an outsider, I'm from Australia right? I, as soon as I arrived I flew in uh, with the rear airlines and I, I just looked down across the atoll and just thought wow this place is so susceptible to overwash as the temperatures are changing, the sea levels are rising. What, can anyone explain to me What's going to do the, the people living here understand what's going to happen over the next 20, 30, 40 years? And I, I, I don't think it's stoppable. Um, coastal uh, erosion, coastal inundation is happening on a daily basis here mm. in Marshall Island. It's a, it's a, it is a fact. Yeah, mm. it's a fact. We, we, yes. we live and yeah. we see that. Yeah. Um, not only on the urban center of Metro, but if you go out to the outer islands. Mm. Some islands are more worse than Majuro. Is it true that a lot of people have moved from the outer atolls to Majuro Island? They've moved away from the US. more isolated? Yes? And the US. And moved to the US as well. Yes. So the population here was 62,000, uh, about 20,000 have gone to the US, is that correct? Mm -hmm. In 2011 it was 53,000, and the latest census is in 2021, it's now 42,000. Wow. 43. So it's about a 20% decrease. 20% decrease in the, decrease in the, the population moved to the USA Mostly. because they can basically. Yeah. Yeah. So they Marshall Islands, Pacific region. As you can see behind me, the erosion of this area, now there's nothing new about erosion from the ocean, it's been happening for thousands of years, but the severity of it is increasing as we're warming the ocean temperatures around us. Uh, global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. Now what happens is you get this thermal mass expansion, salt water expands as it heats, it heats up, uh, and the overwash is changing, so uh, you're getting more severe storms, you're getting more severe wave heights in these surges and the summers are staying longer. The erosion into the Marshall Islands is certainly eating away of a lot of their habitable land, a lot of their arable land is already disappearing and the evidence is everywhere, massive trees basically being swallowed up by the increasing ocean. It's not going to change, it's here to stay and it's something that we need to address in the years to come. It's an old seawall. They're building a lot more seawalls here for obvious reasons. Keep back the seawater. Now, interestingly, this point, uh, atoll side, ocean side. At this point, the section of land here is only about, I'm guessing, 60 metres long. 60 metres in width, sorry. So, you can understand how fragile this nation has become with increasing sea levels. Because as time goes on, the sea levels are coming up from global warming. These countries in the Pacific region are going to be inundated with seawater. Now, the street level in Majura is only about 42 centimetres above high tide level. Now, that's a little bit scary because you think about everyone in the world is predicting a sea level rise of 50 centimetres by 2060, I think. I mean, it's hard to imagine what that's going to do to a nation like this. It's hard to understand how these people are going to cope with water, basically, in their streets, in their homes, eventually 24-7. Population here is 21,000, 18,000 to 21, depending on who you talk to. About 20,000 people have left this nation and gone to live in the USA. They have a big affiliation with America. Ah, here we are. The ocean side. Now how long did that take me? 60 seconds to walk from one side of the country to the other. Atoll, ocean. Uh, if the ocean's increasing in height, the atoll's increasing in height. It's all connected. Been here for a few days. Um, you, you get to understand that 
there's not a lot of money here. This is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a poor nation, but it's not a nation that we're used to seeing in Western society where they can basically solve their own problems as they arrive. They're going to need our help. And you have to remember greenhouse gas emissions, sea level rise, it's not their doing. It's been cast, you be quiet, it's been cast upon them from other nations across the planet. Because as we have this heavy reliance on coal, oil and gas, we're heating the atmosphere, which I told you to shush. No respect. Um, if you're heating the atmosphere, you're also heating the oceans. Heating the oceans, it creates a problem with uh, the pack ice in the Arctic is, is thinning out and melting at an alarming rate, so you're losing that reflective ability. I've covered all these topics before, but coming to somewhere like the Marshall Islands, you can see f firsthand what's actually happening, what's transpiring in one of the nations that's going to get affected, what's already being affected, uh, affected more so than other nations across the globe. Now, we're expecting a sea level rise of half a metre in the next 40 years. I've seen figures bounce all over the place and it's very hard to get a true uh, figure on what's actually coming. But they're all saying the same thing, sea levels are going up, they're not going down. Now, if you live in a country where your street level is 43 centimetres above high tide, you've got to think, hmm, that's a bit of a problem. It's a problem for them. It might not be a problem for you, but you've got to remember, these are your people too. We're all on the one planet. There's nowhere else to go. I did say Another thing to think about is Majora Atoll is made of coal. The entire country is formed up from decomposed coal. So it's not like solid rock, like you'd expect in a nation, maybe where you live. So it, this nation is a lot more fragile than other regions across the planet, so, and more susceptible to erosion from the encroaching ocean. Uh, the ocean surges are getting bigger, because the ocean temperatures are getting warmer, warmer temperature, you get higher waves. Exactly. It's an interesting place. Now, I wandered around the Marshall Islands and I went into houses that have been, there was seaweed on the floor, you know. I don't think they built it with seaweed on the floor. And I saw these massive, big, bloody tea trunks out in the, out in the ocean. And I thought, how'd it get washed out there? And I thought, oh, no, no, it hasn't been washed out there. <laughs> the land's been washed away around it. That used to be land and now it's part of the ocean. So, you know, you see it firsthand and you understand, yes, it is happening, and it's happening to these people before it's happening to a lot of other people. So I, long term, the viability of countries like this, I don't know, it's, uh, uh, it's a difficult question to answer, but wow, it's an interesting place to go, and you certainly learn a lot by being on the ground and talking to the people that live there, you get a much better sense of what's actually happening with global warming, sea level rise, temperature rise, Have air a look at pollution. This. this is some footage I took in Greenland last year. I went out in a friend's boat and I've sat there with my gimbal for a bloody hours. I think it was about minus 20. But the footage was unbelievable. To see these massive icebergs out in the ocean, we travelled up the size of this iceberg, I think for 45 minutes, and I realised it's the same iceberg. Now, it's, they're peeling off, they're coming off these massive glaciers in Greenland. That's where this was filmed. Now, <coughs> the Eki Glacier, Jacobshaven Glacier, peeling into the ocean. Yeah, it's been happening for millions of years, but the balance of replenishment and dispersion has changed because the air temperature has changed. The melt rate is increasing. And for the first time in 2021 in Greenland, there was rainfall. Now, if you think about rainfall where there used to be snowfall, rain, when it falls on uh, ice, it melts into the ice. Snow sits there and settles and packs up and the ice gets thicker. That's changing. So all, this, all these icebergs that are floating out in the North Atlantic Ocean melting, they end up flooding these other poor buggers on the other side of the planet in the Pacific, as well as everywhere else on the Earth. Now, if we lost all of the ice here in Greenland, now the ice cap across Greenland is 
uh, what is it, 2.144 million square miles. I don't remember everything. If we lost all of that ice in Greenland, ocean sea levels would go up by 7.41 metres. Now that is just unbelievable. Uh, biblical problems. But you look at these poor buggers in the Pacific regions, they're already being affected by just the smallest air temperature increase, which is uh, increasing the... Uh, uh, the, the melt rate in the Arctic and the Antarctic, it just goes on and on. And it's just, uh, it's like a domino effect. It's just one thing after the other. It all comes back to greenhouse gas emissions, coal, oil and gas. Now, that's our primary energy resource on Earth. The percentage of renewables, I think it's about 12 to 14%. There's so many studies and the figures are all about, they're all quite similar, you know, 10 to 12 to 13% renewable and the rest is all fossil fuels. Now, you need to reverse that situation. That'll take time, but it needs to be done. Now, you're, a lot of people say, oh, you know, what can I do, what can I do? Well, you could do something, couldn't you? Instead of just sitting there whinging about it and watching the football. I mean, for God's sake, uh, <clears throat> we have to be looking forward 200 years into what planet we want our offspring's offspring to be in. Now, you can't even say, oh, it doesn't really affect me, it's on the other side of the planet. It's all bloody connected, isn't it? No. Anyway, I won't ramble on. I've got some more footage I want you to watch in Majura. It's a fascinating place, and I'm so glad I went there, and I'm very keen to go back. And then in, uh, I've been invited to go and give a talk in Jakarta. Wow, won't that be interesting? You know where that is, Indonesia? That's another place that's been massively increased by, uh, affected, sorry, by sea level rise and air temperature increase. Um, there'll be another story coming out, probably January 2024. But in December 2023, I'm going back here to the Master Islands because I like the people and I think there's a great interest there. Uh, we're going to be interviewing townspeople, people on the ground, people that live there, people that know what's happening to their country, see what they have to say and see what they think about the rest of us pumping all this carbon dioxide into the air and, and you know, basically just doing it non-stop. It's got to stop and it's got to stop pretty bloody soon. Thanks for watching. I'm Dave Lonigan and you've been watching Earth on Fire. 2023. Thank you. That's just what happens. Now greenhouse gases, we all know what they are, right? They're derived from the burning of coal, oil and gas. Now the big problem is it's fine to use those as a primary energy resource, but you're heating the atmosphere. And as you heat the atmosphere, you're speeding up the melt of the ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. I've covered this many times in many shows, and you just need to keep reminding people that's the consequences of what we're doing. Actions have consequences. Now, you start decreasing the Arctic pack sea ice over the summer months, which is what's happening. You're letting more solar radiation into the planet. And just think about it, a reflective white surface, what's it doing? It's reflecting back solar radiation back into space. As that pack ice thins and becomes smaller, you have the surrounding darker oceans which absorb more heat. Now, the ocean is great as absorbing heat. It's a fantastic solar, it's a fantastic uh, carbon sink as well. But the trouble is, you heat up the ocean, you change the salinity levels at the same time because you've got uh, more ice melt coming from the Himalayas and also the Antarctic and Greenland. You've got to remember, Greenland is covered uh, 84% in fresh water frozen in a frozen state in ice and it's up to 2.6 kilometres thick. It's melting at an alarming rate, it's melting into the North Atlantic Ocean and so that's fresh water going into salt, changing the salinity levels of the oceans at the same time as heating them. So it's interrupting a lot of, um, uh, they're very noisy folks, I'm sorry, you're interrupting that natural flow of ocean currents, warm currents coming from the equatorial regions up north. You, it's slowing it down, but the waters are getting warmer. So in turn, 
more pack ice is melting faster and then you look at the Antarctic you've got Fates Glacier hanging on by a shoestring and behind that there's untold known amount of water capacity to flood into the Southern Ocean. I've read many reports and the figures are absolutely staggering. I'm unclear how they can actually work out these measurements but they're all of huge quantities, massive areas of the Antarctic below sea level. So as soon as you allow, uh, you, you lose that plug, which is a glacial plug holding back all that fresh water behind it, you're going to get a huge influx of fresh water going into the ocean. You're speeding up the melt rate. Now, I'll be interested to see in a few years if we don't get a sudden increase in ocean heights because of the amount of water that is held in the Antarctic, which is holding on by a shoestring. There's a lot of scientific groups are watching this. It's very hard to monitor. They're only using satellite um, technology because you're not going down to the Antarctic, you know, and, and trudging around in your boots and having a look. It's too cold, too remote, too hard to get to, and a very, very dangerous place. But all the data is saying the same thing, melting at an alarming rate, pouring more fresh water into the other southern oceans, change in the salinity, then you're getting things like different fish species coming into areas they weren't in before, competing with um, what, you know, the natural environment is changing. And then you look at South America where they're cutting down trees, like unbelievable, another oxygen tent which we're destroying at an alarming rate. Uh, you go back to Greenland, um, I've done a few programs on that and the ice melt up there is accelerating. It's been accelerating since about 1930. Now they've got data going back, the Americans from when they had a, um, they were, they had a station base there during World War II, did a lot of core samples. They're now examining those core samples over in the US. I was reading some information on this recently and it's, ba it's basically given them a window into what carbon, carbon monoxide levels were in the air back in the 40s compared to now. And the increase over the last uh, 80 years is staggeringly dangerous. When you look at the data, you just think everywhere you look, there's another problem. And it's all caused by humans, greenhouse gas emissions, and the failure to adapt a more sensible approach to energy resource. We all need energy, we all know that. Um, the reasons why we're, we're sticking with coal, oil and gas, known quantities, uh, easy to access. You know, the first coal-fired power station was developed 140 years ago. They crushed coal, they set fire to it, to boil water, to make steam, to turn a turbine to generate electricity. I mean, come on, this is insane. You have to have a better way than that. And there is, it's above us, it's called the sun. So solar power is the future, solar, wind, wave power. These are the technologies our government and big industry should be looking into rather than constantly going back to the known, you know, the usual, oh, let's dig out more coal, let's dig out more, burn more oil. It's, it's crazy. And as ironically, as you're getting this thaw in the polar regions up across Siberia, the US and Canada, permafrost is thawing. So access to that land um, for, for drilling to find more gas reserves, more oil reserves, there's more access, more drilling, more fossil fuels. Crazy. So the very thing that's actually causing the problem is giving them more access to plunder more resources in those regions which before were inaccessible. inaccessible. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of gas exploration, oil exploration in the Arctic Oceans. The Russians are certainly interested in it because it's right on their doorstep and as that pack ice is decreasing, decreasing, uh, their access into the Arctic Ocean is going to be freed up and less expensive for them to uh, explore. And, and access more oil, more gas, and in accessing more oil, more gas, and more coal, what are you doing? You're burning more fossil fuels, more carbon monoxide going into the into the into the air. The problem only gets bigger. And in the meantime, all these poor buggers in these low-lying areas that are being affected by uh, sea level rise. Incidentally, the majority of them 
are the ones that can at least afford it the most. So the people that can afford to be affected the most are being affected the most by the people that have the money to change their ways and do something else. Why don't we do something else? Well, interesting, isn't it? When you look at COVID-19, the whole world bands are together to fight that, that issue. But are we doing that in a global effect, in a global way to fight, to fight climate change? I don't think so. Not from what I'm seeing, not from what I'm reading. We've just got a heavier reliance on fossil fuels than ever before, increasing population. As our population increases, we're accessing more fossil fuels, heating up the atmosphere. And you've got to remember, we don't have anywhere else to go. We only have one planet. And if someone lives on the other side of the planet who's affected by your country accessing more fossil fuels, you're affecting your neighbours. We're all basically in the same backyard. And the attitude of, oh, well, it's not affecting me. Yeah, not yet. You know. Think about Florida. Think about New York. Now, the Americans, very technologically advanced, very financially capable of looking into, into alternative fuels, which they are, but at the same time, they are one of the biggest users of fossil fuels on, on, on the planet outside of China. Now, China's opened up 234 new coal-fired power stations in the last two years. 234. There's already 8,094 power stations on the planet that use coal as their energy to generate electricity. So it's not decreasing. You look at Australia, uh, one of the sunniest, as I said before, one of the sunniest planets on the world, one of the highest users of fossil fuels on the planet per capita. The Australians are one of the worst polluters. Well done, Aussie. Then you come to uh, countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland, very into alternative power, power use, and, and the Netherlands, great. But the thing is, such small populations, you know, populations of five, six, seven, eight million, switching over from fossil fuels to renewables, but they're a very small player. You're getting more um, electric cars taken up in Scandinavian regions than anywhere else on the planet, but very, very small percentage globally. The US car market, um, they uh, dabble in electric cars, but the problem is their primary energy resource is a fossil fuel. So using a fossil fuel to recharge a car that's electric and their take up with, with electric cars uh, per head is one of the lowest on the planet, but they have the technology uh, certainly to push ahead. And I often wonder, is it the big industries, the big players, you know, um, these oil companies that are basically putting things in play to keep the electric cars out of the market for as long as possible because it all comes down to money. The more money they can make, the more interested they are. And I think things won't really change until electric cars become cheaper than petrol and diesel vehicles on the road. Some nations are ruling out the use of diesel vehicles by the year 2030 in, in Europe. That's great. But again, small players on the market. Uh, we need to see a global effort where all the countries in the world talk to each other and say, hey, we do have a problem, rather than, yeah, we do have a problem when they're going to do nothing about it, which is what everyone's seeing. Um, I, I'm just staggered that more hasn't been done because we already have the technology.